Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the word this morning. Father, I want to thank you so much for your goodness. And I think as we just ponder all the ways that you've answered our prayers lately, Lord, just how merciful you are. How we don't deserve oftentimes what we ask for, yet you are a kind and compassionate God. Whether you answer our prayers the way we want or not, Lord, we attest that you are a good God. You are faithful. And so as I open your word this morning, I ask that you would do what I cannot do. That you would open our eyes to see you for who you are. That our faith would be strengthened and encouraged. That our resolve to trust you no matter what we're going through would be strengthened. And the enemy in our own lives, Lord, would be kept at bay as we keep our trust in you and your promises. I pray this in his name. Amen. So we're back in the book of Genesis. If you have a Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open to Genesis chapter 12. As we make our way through the next part of Genesis, the, the life of Abram. Um, thus far in Genesis, we've learned of two covenants that God has made with man. The first was God's covenant with Adam and Eve. And the second was God's covenant with Noah, which, as we saw, was an everlasting covenant made with all mankind. Well, today we're going to look at the beginning of the third covenant God made with man, the Abrahamic covenant. And this covenant marks the beginning of God's special relationship with a people that will be referred to as his children. This passage also marks the beginning of the count of the great patriarch Abraham. Now, if you remember right, it was Abraham's faith that Paul used as an example in the book of Romans. It, it, it was insightful, insightful for us to study and to see how Abraham's faith resembles true, genuine, saving faith. And I think it will also be insightful for us to study Abraham's life of faith from the historical perspective as well. How did Abram go from worshiping idols to trusting in the one true God alone? It all started with the special calling from God. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, one may wonder, did Abraham know the Lord when he got this call? Did he just hear a voice in the sky and decided that that was God and to follow him? Well, according to Stephen's speech in Acts chapter 7, before Stephen was stoned, he mentions that God appeared to Abram before he moved to Haran while he still lived in Ur. In Acts chapter 7, it says this. Stephen is relaying his history. He says, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land into which you are now living. Now remember, Genesis is not giving us all the details. But it appears that God first actually appeared to Abram before his dad moved him to Haran. God appeared to Abram in Ur and called him to Canaan. But they ended up in Haran instead. Remember in Genesis eleven thirty one, we looked at this last week. Terran took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. We weren't told why. We weren't told why they left Ur and were headed to Canaan. But when you put that together with Acts 7, you see the reason they left Ur to go to Canaan was because God had called Abram to go. But they ended up in Haran. And we saw, we talked about last week of how that was a very prominent place for this moon idol that they worshipped. 
Why did they end up in Haran? Perhaps Abram's father refused to leave Haran once he arrived. Perhaps he said, you know what? Let's stop by Haran before we go to... And then he ended up staying there. Maybe his health wasn't well at the time. There's all kinds of reasons that he could have ended up there instead. Okay, whatever the case, after Terah's death... God calls Abram to leave Haran and go to Canaan where he originally called him to go. And this time, Abram obeyed. Verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So Abraham obeyed God's command to leave Haran and go to Canaan. This divine call to leave his property and kinsmen came with some promises. Now, I didn't realize this last time, but remember, Abram had another brother, Nahor, and Nahor ended up staying in Ur. He did not go to Canaan with them. So even there, there was a family split. Okay, verse 2 in chapter 12. I'll make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, God promises Abram. So that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse, and in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham was given a command, and then he was given a promise. The divine promise was threefold. God promised to make a great nation from Abram. This meant that even though Abram was entering into a land of foreign nations... He would make Abram into his own great nation. Great meaning large and important. This is not only an impressive promise because Abram has no children. How are you going to make someone into a great nation if they don't have any children? But it's also an impressive promise because the only way to start a nation in a foreign land inhabited with large foreign nations is to overthrow them. The, the land of Canaan's already inhabited. To go there and to make a great nation means you're going to have to conquer other nations. How would such a promise ever come to pass? God also promised to bless Abram and make him a blessing to all people. The blessing of making his name great means he would be revered by many. And somehow he would become a Huge blessing to all the families of the earth. Now this too is an incredible promise. Because to be a blessing to all the families of the earth would include everyone who's living during Abram's time. Everybody who lived before Abram's time. And everyone who lived after Abram's time. The Hebrew language is clear. All the families of the earth means everybody would be blessed somehow through Abram. How would such a promise ever come to pass? I want you to picture yourself in Abram's shoes. These are not promises that would have been easily believed. It would have took some incredible faith to believe these promises. God also promised to protect Abram by blessing those who blessed him and cursing those who dishonored him. What a glorious promise. That God would ensure that Abram is honored by blessing those who bless Abram and judging those, pronouncing judgment on those who do not. This is a promise of divine protection. God is promising Abram, I myself will protect you. God himself would actively intervene to protect Abram. Now, what stands out most about these promises, which probably would have seemed very far-fetched to Abram, like, what I, how, like to imagine how these are going to unfold, it would have been absolutely impossible. But what stands out the most about these promises is the conjunction between the command and the promises. The word and is a very important word here because it reveals what type of covenant God is making with Abram. See, there are two types of covenants in the Bible. 
There are conditional covenants and there are unconditional covenants. In a conditional covenant, both parties agree to fulfill certain conditions. If either party fails to meet their responsibilities, the covenant is broken and neither party has to fulfill the expectations of the covenant. An unconditional covenant is an agreement between two parties, but only one of the two parties has to do something. Nothing is required of the other party. Since this co covenant includes a command, one might conclude that it is a conditional covenant. In other words, one might think if Abraham obeys the command, God will make of him a great nation, bless his name greatly, and bless all others through him. If he does not obey the command, God will not do those things. That would be a conditional covenant. But that's not the way it's worded. The word if is not present. Instead of the command, instead the command is given and the promises are given. No correlation between the two. In the English language, you cannot make a condition without the word if. Like, if you go to the store, I'll go to the bank. That has a very different meaning than you go to the store and I'll go to the bank. The lather infers that I'm going to the bank whether you go to the store or not. So God commanded Abram to leave and then promises to bless him despite his reaction to the command. So God's promises to Abram are unconditional promises. This will be made even more clear when we get to chapter 15, but it is very important. Abram does not have to do anything in order for the promises made to him to be true. God's promises to Abram are not dependent on Abram at all. God alone has a decisive role in the covenant. The unfolding of the promises are not dependent on Abram's obedience. They will come to pass for one decisive reason. God said it would be so. However, the reason the command is given with the covenant is because obedience is a necessary means of accomplishing the promises. In other words, God does not allow Abram the ability to disrupt the promises. They are not contingent on his obedience. It would have been easy for God to make him contingent on his obedience. If you obey me, I will bless you. He does that many times with Israel. God makes many um, conditional covenants. Like in Deuteronomy 28, when he's talking to Israel, and he says, If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. That's a conditional promise. If you obey me, I will bless you. He didn't use the word if with Abram. He didn't say, if you obey me and leave and go to Canaan, I will bless you. This is, no, this is important, that, that this is an unconditional promise for three reasons. Number one, because Abram is not responsible for the promises. He's not responsible. Okay? He can't mess them up. They can't be altered. They will come to pass no matter what he does. There's no pressure on Abram to do anything in order for the promises to come to pass. Secondly, it's important because it means that God is fully responsible for the promises. If they don't come to pass, it's completely his fault. Nobody else's, because God chose to make them in such a way that gives him full responsibility for their outcome. And third, since God is faithful, his promises to Abram will come to pass. 
they will happen. That's what I love about an unconditional promise is because when God gives it, you just know it's going to happen. Unconditional covenants come with the ability to rest in God's unfaithfulness or in God's faithfulness. We don't, wanna, we don't have to worry about God being unfaithful because he's always faithful. And so an unconditional promise made to us means we can rest in it. We don't have to be worried that we have to keep our end of the deal. It comes with a certain amount of peace and comfort. Abram didn't have anything to worry about because God graciously did not use the word if. Abram could be fully confident that God would do what he said he would do. However, so where it gets a little complicated. However, Abram's obedience to God's command was a means that God would use to bring about the promised results. So you might say, well, how could God have done what he promised to do if Abraham wouldn't have obeyed? Well, that's a good question. If God's commanding Abraham to do something, Abram to do something, he has to do it. He needs to do it in order for things to go the way God promised they would go. In fact, you might be scratching your head and wondering how that could be, how both of those could be true or Maybe you're just scratching your head trying to figure out what in the world is he talking about. Well, let me take one more stab at explaining it because I really think this is important. God told Israel later on in Deuteronomy, if you obey me, I'll bless you. And there were times where God blessed Israel because they were obedient. But there were times when God did not bless Israel because they were not obedient. God kept his promises both ways. Because God said, if you don't obey me, I'm not going to bless you. So God was still keeping his promise, even though they were not being blessed by it. So it was Israel's fault they were not being blessed by God. But the promise made to Abram did not come with requirements. Therefore, the promised blessings would come to pass no matter what. But they came to pass through Abram's obedience to the command as well as through a lot of other means. So Abram's obedience was a result of God's fulfilled promises, not the other way around. Okay? Israel was not blessed at times because it was their fault. They didn't obey the promise. Abram didn't have to worry about that. God's unconditional promises resulted in Abram's obedience. In other words, since God's promises to Abraham were unconditional and the command was a means of them coming to pass, what that means is the commands had to be effectual. In other words, when God commands you to do something, there's times he makes sure what he commands you to do will come to pass. He's an all-powerful God. And he's able to do that. Even though Abraham made decisions and chose to obey God and chose to follow God, as we're going to see, there's a reason why he chose to do so. Okay? All that means is God assured that the command would be obeyed. The life of Abram is an example of how obedience in our life is a result of salvation. It's also an example of how salvation is not reliant on our obedience. So when we look at Abraham's life, we see very clearly how it works with us in terms of salvation and our obedience to him. Think about it. Is there a condition to salvation? In the Bible, is there a condition that God makes for salvation? The answer is yes. If you remember from Romans chapter 10, go back to our Roman days here. See the word if? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, here's the promise, you will be saved. So the only requirement for salvation is faith. You have to believe. God says that. Not everybody is promised salvation. Only those who believe. So it's different than the covenant made with Abram. 
But what we will see is that we'll see that clearly from Abraham's life, that he was given salvation because he believed in God. But once the promise is initiated through faith, obedience is the result. So in other words, we're not told you have to obey God and do all of his commands to be saved. But what does happen when we put our faith in God? The result is a life of obedience. It's kind of like James said in James chapter 2. He says, and he's actually speaking of Abraham here. He says, you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works and scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. So Abraham obeyed God. Why? Because he believed the promises of God. God made promises, right? He gave a command and then he made promises Abraham believed those promises. That's why he obeyed the command. Abraham believed the promises, so he obeyed the command. We are commanded to leave our sin and to believe in Jesus. Eternal life is promised. If we believe the promise, we will repent and believe in Jesus. We don't obey to earn our salvation. We obey the gospel because we believe the gospel promises. And so right here in Genesis chapter 12, you see the beginning of something very beautiful. Abraham putting his faith in God. And that faith results in obedience to God. It makes, it, I think if you just lay it at, at ground level, it becomes very clear. Why did Abraham leave and go to Canaan like God told him to do? Because he believed the promises that God made him. He trusted in God. Hebrews 11 points this out concerning Abraham. Verse 8 says, By faith Abram Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that was received as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. It took faith. He had no idea where he was going. He had no idea who lived there, whether they were going to kill him, what was going to happen. But he did it by faith. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that had foundations, whose designer and builder is God. God's going to have to build this nation. He said there's no human way possible for this to happen. This nation that he's promising, this, this blessedness has to come from God, and I'm trusting him to do the impossible. Abram really believed that God was going to do what he said he would do, and he wanted what was promised so he packed up and left. Verse 5, Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. Abram took his wife. He took his nephew Lot, all his belongings, and all his servants, and he headed right where God told him to head. And when they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oaks of Morah. And that time, the, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Now, that's significant because the Canaanites were the descendants of Canaan, Ham's son, who was cursed by Noah. And remember, it was Shem, Abraham's ancestor, who Noah prophesied would enslave Canaan's descendants. They would be his slaves. Now, I'm convinced Abraham probably knew that. He knew that promise and wondered if maybe that promise would be fulfilled by him. You see here, they started in Ur, they went up to Haran, and then back down into Canaan, about the middle there at Shechem. So Abraham, Abram comes to this town, 
to a famous tree where God appears to Abram again. Verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now this time the promise is more specific. God promises to give Abram's descendants the land of the Canaanites. <clears throat> Once again, this promise is astounding since Abram is old and has no descendants. And since God does not promise to give the land directly to Abram, but rather to his offspring, he knows this promise will not be fulfilled anytime soon. So he pitches his tent out in the hill country. Verse 8, from there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. And when Bethel, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going towards to Negeb. So Abram was a sojourner in the land that was promised to him. It wasn't his yet. But one day he would own the land that he resided in. For now he would pitch a tent, and a, a temporary tent, and call upon the Lord, waiting for him to fulfill his promises. That was a, a, a good symbol of Abram's life. Waiting on the Lord to do what the Lord said he would do, that Abram knew he couldn't make come to pass. Now, what did Abram do as he waited for God to fulfill his promises? He worshiped God, made an altar, and he sought God in prayer, called upon the name of the Lord as he waited the fulfillment of his promises. Now, are we not in the same situation as Abram? We live in this land as sojourners. We are not of this world. This is not our home. We do not fit in with our corrupt culture or society. And one day this, pro this earth has been promised to us. In Revelation 5.10, it says, You have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, talking about us, and they shall reign on the earth. We will reign on this earth one day. But for now, we await the promises of eternity. We're just waiting. Building our tents, waiting. And what do we do as we wait the fulfillment of all the promises that are ours in Christ Jesus? We worship God and we call upon him as we wait the fulfillment of his promises. And I'll just go ahead and give kind of a sneak peek to what's coming. If you know the life of Abram. Whenever God, Abram waited upon the Lord patiently, things went very well for him. The only time things didn't go well for Abram is when he tried to hurry up what God had promised. That's the Christian life. We live in a world where so many things are promised to us by God, but not yet. We have to wait. We're waiting for all of these glorious promises to come to pass. And sometimes we get impatient. And sometimes we try to seek satisfaction in other things because we're tired of waiting. But waiting on the Lord is exactly how God set things up for Abram because he wanted Abram to exercise faith in those promises that he had given him. So our encouragement from Abram is to do this. Focus on Jesus Christ. Focus on his promises. Trust him. Trust the promises. He is faithful. No matter what you're going through, he is faithful. Every promise in Christ will come to pass. Because once you're a believer in Jesus Christ, once you put your faith in him, do you realize the promises of eternity are unconditional. God will bless you. God will love you. God will show his favor upon you because you are his child. Once Abram trusted God, 
and had that faith in God, the, the covenant was unconditional. Just like God's covenant is unconditional with his children. He will bless us. Eternity is coming. Blessings of untold, incredible blessings, glorious blessings, eternal blessings are, uh, are coming our way. And we are to wait on him. Trust him. Obey him. Seek him. Worship him as we wait and trust that those promises will be ours one day. Father, I pray that you would fill us with that hope. Fill us with excitement <clears throat> and joy and hope at all that's going to be ours one day in Christ. A perfect relationship with you. A life without sin. Reigning with you forever and ever. Help us to believe the promises. So much so that it causes us to not only look forward to what's coming. But that it would cause us to obey you. And to trust you. Thank you for all the promises you've given us. Thank you for the example of Abram in the Bible. Of what that looks like. As we walk in obedience. And trust the promises. And trust you. Amen.